I have to admit that. Yeah. Everyone, um, it's nice to be back in the college. My name is Martin Phillips, and I'm currently over on the other side of the campus, but it's my pleasure to uh, welcome my very good friend Bruce Party to the College of Law. Bruce and I have known each other for over 20 years yeah, now, I guess. Yeah. Bruce and I were that teaching very old. yes, teaching colleagues way back in the mists of time in New Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, and we had the great pleasure of actually co-teaching a class, which was very good, because I disagreed with absolutely everything that Bruce said. And he disagreed with everything that uh, I said. We had a great time, but the students couldn't make head and tail of it. But we had fun. Anyway, but I do assure you that Bruce is usually right, except when he's arguing with me. And um, we're going to have a very interesting and uh, provocative presentation. I'm sure Bruce has never one to uh, not tell us exactly what he thinks about something. Bruce um, uh, originally was a litigation lawyer at BLG in Toronto before uh, moving to New Zealand to start his academic career at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Having taught there for several years and including doing some teaching stints in San Diego, and the University of Western Ontario, he joined the faculty of law at Queen's University 12, 12 years ago, where he has risen through the ranks to be professor of law. He's a part-time member of the Ontario Environmental Review Tribunal. He served a term as associate dean of the faculty of law at Queen's University, and currently he is on sabbatical in Bozeman, Montana, uh, where he's a fellow at the Property and Environment Research Centre in, in Bozeman. Um, his research and scholarship is in the area of environmental law and governance, ecosystem management, climate change, civil liability, torts, etc. He covers a wide range of areas and he's an excellent speaker and I'm delighted to welcome my good friend Bruce Party to the podium. Bruce. Thank you, uh, Marcus, very much and for the invitation to come. Uh, to, is, my, is the mic uh, working all right? Can you hear me? Is not working. Do you need it to work? Can you hear me anyway? I need it for the video. So, so I just keep talking until you just to test yeah. what you're doing over there. Is it switched on? Oh, maybe it's not switched on. Aha! Uh -huh. The on button, you know, I'm not really technically. Uh, <laughs> is that better? Can you hear me now? Can you can't hear me now? Yes, nod, yeah, shake your yeah. head, yes? Yeah. Okay, good. good. Yeah, um, among other things, uh, Martin and Marianne uh, run the, uh, the best environmental law conference in the country, where uh, most of the uh, environmental academics in the country, along with a number of lawyers and other people, gather, and it is basically uh, known to be the place to be in the field. Now in, in Bozeman, Montana, which is where I am right now, I'm at this place, as Martin mentioned, called the Property and Environment Research Center. And it turns out that this place is dominated by economists. It's a place that believes, most of the people who are there anyway, believe in free market environmentalism. I am finding that I'm spending most of my time there arguing with the economists. Now, I thought that I believe in free markets as well as uh, solutions to some kind of environmental problems. And I think that's still true, but it turns out that what I mean by a free market and what they mean by a free market is not exactly the same thing. What they appear to mean is a market that achieves the highest possible social welfare, the highest aggregate economic welfare. And in order to achieve this maximum productivity, they are inclined to want to fill, to adjust legal rights and legal rules so as to arrange to achieve that maximum efficiency. And that's not my idea of a free market. That's my idea of a manipulated market. I'll get back to that a little bit later. One of the things that the economists and I agree about is their seminar rules. When you do a seminar at PERC, the general rule is you've got five minutes. Say your piece, get to the point, and then we'll attack you. <laughs> so I'm going to keep this short, and I invite your questions and 
comments and challenges, and please don't be shy. All right, so I have a theory, or at least a guess. And the guess is this, that many of you in this room and many of the people out there who are involved in environmental law in some respect believe in two core ideas about the law. And that those two core ideas, those two core ideas that you believe in, conflict. That they cannot live side by side. They cannot coexist. The two, the two ideas are these. The first one, uh, and this is the, uh, sorry, this is an aside. I'm just putting this up on the board. I'll come back to this near the end. This is the section 41 of uh, the Saskatchewan Environmental Management Protection Act. I want to use this as an illustration of a uh, point I'm going to make. So I'll just park that. I'll get back to it. The first idea that I suspect that you believe in is this one. This happens to be the motto on the crest of the Law Society of Upper Canada. No one's told the lawyers in charge that the name of the province has changed to Ontario. <laughs> um, but the motto is, let right prevail. In other words, let justice be done. The purpose of the law is to achieve the right result. The second idea is the rule of law. That idea that nations should be ruled by law and not by persons. Because the rule of persons is an arbitrary force and has the risk of being subjected to tyranny. The case I want to make to you is that these two ideas conflict. And they cannot both be sound. And furthermore, that of all the areas of law, the one now that is most instrumentalist in the let right prevail sense is environmental law. It is not the only one by any means, but I think it is probably one of the most extreme examples of an area of law that is now done in an instrumentalist manner, which is what this idea suggests. Okay, so what do these two ideas mean? Let me, let me propose some definitions. Instrumentalism, as the word suggests, is a, an approach to law that says that the most important thing about law is that it is an instrument, a means by which to achieve certain kinds of results. What counts in the practice of legal instrumentalism is the result, the answer, the goal, and the end product. And law is a means to that end. If you use law in the proper way, the results will be proper. And what it takes to get there is perhaps not completely unimportant, but not as important as where you get to in the end. Legal instrumentalism means the following kinds of things. It means that you are governing for ends in both the public policy sense and in the sense of trying to achieve some notion of the public good. And of course, environmental law is very much involved in this search. It means that judges in courtrooms, members of the executive and ministries, tribunals, are involved in ad hoc decisions. So, for example, if you're a judge, the most important thing to achieve in the dispute between the plaintiff and the defendant Sure, you've got your law over here, you're supposed to apply the law of facts, all that kind of stuff, but what really counts is whether or not you have done justice to the parties. Is the outcome morally appropriate? Does it reflect an innate sense of justice? So all of these players, be they judges, be they bureaucrats, be they politicians, be they members of agencies, deputy ministers, or whoever, they are all involved at directing outcomes. They are involved in imagining what a proper formulation of the public good is, and then participating in this task of managing society so as to achieve those goals. So if you want a, a picture, you know how uh, 
When we say justice is blind, we see the statue of the large folded lady with the scales. So she can't see. Justice is blind. The statue of the legal instrumentalist is the man at the control room, at the panel, adjusting things, adjusting interest rates and tax incentives and government advertising, whether or not the goal is fewer people smoking or more insulation in your house or more people buying or more people saving or more people buying houses or people not running up their credit card debt or more manufacturing facilities in this place as opposed to this place. In other words, there's lots of things to control. And those things are to be controlled in order to achieve the particular aim that each particular notion is designed to achieve. It's a very intricate, hands-on kind of process involving all the various arms of government who together are involved in managing this situation. The instrumentalist is In contrast, a rule of law suggests the opposite idea. Now, to be sure, the rule of law is not a monolithic idea, and there are competing versions of what it means. But at its core is the contrast between the rule of law on the one hand and the rule of persons on the other. The purpose of the rule of law is to insulate us from the idiosyncratic inclinations of the individuals who might rule. The rule of law is impersonal. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are. The rules that should be applied to you are the same as the rules that should be applied to the next home. If that's not the case, then somebody is taking the blindfold off to see who it is that you, uh, that you are and what characteristics that you have, and where you live, and how old you are, and how much money you make, and how many kids you have, what industry you're in, and you know, all those little details that provide context. What matters in the rule of law is the content of the general rules. The rule of law consists of a collection of these abstract rules that apply to everybody, everywhere, and can be applied in a neutral, dispassionate way. Courts, are, courts and government officials are detached from any dispute that arises. They don't really care what happens in a particular case as long as the outcome is consistent with the general rules that exist. So here's a quote from one famous rule of law advocate, Frederick Hayek. The rule of law means that government in all its activities is bound by rules fixed and announced beforehand. In other words, one of the functions of the rule of law is to provide for restrictions on the authority of those who govern, so as to limit their discretion, so as to limit their ability to act idiosyncratically. How do you do this? Well, oh, this is a partial list. We're familiar with many of these. Old ideas, like hashtag rules, separation of powers, you know, the three branches of the government, Courts and executive and legislature, they all do a different thing. The idea of precedent, like cases being decided alike, the requirement for readings from courts, and the existence of rights. Rights meaning a legal status that cannot, cannot simply be set aside because they stand in the way of some desirable result. So here's the separation of powers idea. The point is, that the separation of powers between these branches of government provide that there is no single person or entity within government who could take it upon him or herself to decide an issue by themselves. Why? Well, because each of these pieces is dealt with by a different branch. You've got the general rules being enacted by legislatures or being developed by courts over a long period of time through the common law process. You've got the executive and the, the officials within ministries who are powerless to do anything except to put the general rules into effect, because that's the mandate and the only mandate they have. And then the courts dealing with a particular dispute who have the power only to apply those general rules and not to make claims that otherwise. So 
in each case and each step along the way, each actor is constrained by their role within the separation. All right, so let's contrast these two things. Through an instrumentalist approach, what counts are the facts. You want facts first. And then, once you figure out what the facts are and what innately just, uh, just results is appropriate, then you can sort of figure out how to do things so that you get that result. In other words, context is everything in an instrumentalist approach. Under a rule of law, justice is one. Context doesn't count at all. In fact, if you consider context, you are committing a violation of the idea. What counts is the content of the general rules. Because if the content of those rules is correct, then the results will adapt to themselves. And you don't have to worry about those. Here's the poster boy for legal instrumentalism. Here's a depiction of King Solomon. You know the story, right? King Solomon and two women who have a dispute over a child, each claiming the child is her own. And they go to the king, and each claims the child, and the king doesn't know what to do. So he says, fine, if you can't decide and can't tell me who this child belongs to, fine, I'll just split the child in two. Whereupon one woman says, fine, that's the way it has to be, and that's, that's the way it has to be. And the other one says, no, don't give her to the first one. Whereupon the king gives her, gives the child to the second one, because that one must be the mother. Now, the brilliant way to solve that problem. But the job of judges under a rule of law is not to solve problems. It is to apply the law. If you try to imagine a poster boy, not for real instrumentalism, but for the rule of law, try this one. <laughs> King Henry VIII, as imagined by the CBC. Now, why is he a poster boy for the rule of law? Well, because of this truism that is patently obvious, but conveniently ignored, is that the right result is always, always, always a subjective judgment. And you know, we may approve with Solomon's resolution of this problem, and we may not agree with King Henry VIII's resolution of most of his problems, which consisted mostly of off with their head. But in Henry's world, that's the right result. Let right prevail, and there it is. And that's only possible because in Henry's world, there is no rule of law. Because he is the rule of law, and that is the rule of persons. So if you're going to be protected from chopping off your head, then you must also be protected from having problems resolved in this arbitrary way. You can't have both. You can't pick your ruler based upon whether or not they have to agree with you. Because you can't count them. So, let me go back to my economists and the dispute that we were having and continue to have. These particular economists believe in maximizing aggregate economic welfare, meaning maximizing the productivity of society. And they're very, very good at calculating when this economic efficiency is achieved. So let me give you an example. Um, imagine a dispute between uh, two neighboring landowners. One is a uh, farmer growing crop crops, and one is a rancher with cattle. And there's no fence between them. And the cattle tend to wander from the land of the rancher to the land of the farmer. And when they do that, they destroy the crops. 
The economists say, this is uh, based upon the work of uh, Ronald Coase, who many might um, recognize him, have done a lot of formulative work in this area, going back to the 1960s. He says, in terms of achieving economic efficiency between these two people, it doesn't matter whether or not the farmer has the right to keep the cattle out, or the rancher has the right to let the cattle wander in. As long as one of them has the right to do one thing or the other, then the parties will bargain. And whatever the highest value of activity is, that's the one that will happen. So if the farmer has to allow to keep the rancher out, and the cattle is, the cattle is more valuable grazing on that land than your crops, then the rancher will bargain with the farmer and pay him to allow the cattle to water. On the other hand, if the, the rancher has the right to let the cattle water and the crops turn out to be more valuable, then the farmer will pay the rancher to keep the cattle out. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the distribution of rights is in that case, because the aggregate economic welfare will be achieved anyway. Now, they say most situations are more complicated than that. The transaction costs are higher, and there's more parties involved. So if you have a situation where there's a factory polluting, for example, and there are residences nearby, and they're discussing with the smoke, well, you have, to, you have to measure the value, the cost, and the benefits of the factory and sort of the residences. Or, and figure out a system of legal rights so that the outcome will allow the highest value activity to proceed. So all those calculations are correct. I've got no problem with them at all. The difficulty is this. After the written calculations to tell us whether or not this maximum productivity will be achieved, then the implied message sometimes explicitly occasionally, but mostly implied is, and that's what we should do. We should fiddle with things and adjust rights and rules so that we achieve the maximum aggregate welfare. That's their definition of the right result. And how do they want to do that? Going down to number three, the legal method for doing that is to look at each particular situation on its own facts, figure out what each activity is worth, and then adjust things accordingly. In other words, it is an entirely utilitarian instrumentalist practice in which the rights of individuals are subject to this figuring out. There is very little of the rule of law left in that process. The public good, as defined by the economists to mean economic welfare on a social basis, is in their minds normatively prior to legal rights. The rights don't really matter as long as you achieve this objective. Whereas, under a rule of law approach, that's backwards. Stop, we said before you start measuring things and start adjusting things, what are your legal rights? This is where we start. And what you've got a right, you've got a right. And that right is not subject to the adjustment so as to achieve a particular result in a particular case. So, here is the section of the statute that I wanted to talk about. I want to take this this section in two bits. And my case is going to be this, that those economists that I was talking about and the environmentalists that I know are in the same camp. Not because the environmentalists believe in maximizing economic welfare, <coughs> but because the environmentalists, like the economists, are instrumentalists through and through and through. Because to an environmentalist, at least some of them, I don't want to brush them all with the same brush, but to many environmentalists, what matters is the result. What happens out there in the field? How many wolves are there in the park? Too many, too few. Whatever we need to get to do to get there, 
is what counts. So the definition of the right result between the environmentalists and these economists is completely different, but not different in terms of their imagining about how to proceed. How to proceed? Well, imagine what we need. And then we'll figure out how to get there. And that's not a rule of law approach. So let me divide this section of this statute into two. Let's consider the first half first. It says this. No person shall discharge a substance into the environment in an amount, concentration, or level, or at a rate of release that they cause an adverse effect. And just to fill in the, the, uh, the bit here, the definition of adverse effect, which you may or may not be able to read where you are, adverse effect means impairment of or damage to the environment or harm to human health caused by one or any combination of any chemical, physical, or biological alteration. Now, this kind of section in a provincial environmental statute is pretty standard. Ontario has one too, and lots of other places do as well. This first half of this section is on its way to being a really good rule. A really good rule in the rule of law sense. It establishes what's prohibited. Gives definition to them. People are, have got a means to figure out what it is they are and they're not allowed to do, which is one of the tests of a good rule of law rule. But then we go on. And the second half of this section fills in this way. No person shall discharge and so on. And last, otherwise expressly authorized, pursuant to this act, or the regulations, or any other act, or their regulations, or any approval, permit, license, or order. This second half of this section has transformed this rule from a rule that was a good rule to an entirely instrumentalist tool. It no longer expresses a general prohibition. All it says is, your ability to do certain things is subject to our approval. So if you want to do something, come in. And that's all it says. In fact, this rule is even worse, or in fact, much worse, than the economist's approach. Because the economists have at least told us what their criteria is. They've said, we'll do whatever fiddling is necessary to achieve the maximum aggregate welfare. What's the criteria here? When the ministry decides how they're going to issue approvals, or orders, or develop regulations, What's the criteria? How would they put it? No idea. Because they don't want to say. Because the criteria, frankly, from what I have seen, is to be blunt about it and crude, is political expediency. And that means that the criteria changes from place to place to place in time to time to time, moment to moment to moment, person to person to person, industry to industry to industry. Oh, sure, there are regulations, and just there are guidelines. But there is discretion in every step along the way, in what the regulations say, in what the guidelines say, as to how the regulations will be imposed, what the regulations mean, what the conditions of an approval will mean, when an order is issued, Every step along the way is highly discretionary. And if you were to try and figure out ahead of time what the situation is, it's hopeless. They don't want to do that because they want control. They want to be sitting at the control panel working it out. Because sometimes it's appropriate for this factory to get the approval because that factory is a source of employment for that town. And they don't want to shut that down. But over here, when this guy has a cottage on his lake and he's fiddling with the, with the shore, well, all the other owners on that lake don't like the fact he's fiddling with the shore and there's no economic consequences to shutting that down. So in that situation, it's safe. Let's shut that down. 
but let's not worry about this. So economics, social factors, political factors, all kinds of things thrown into the mix, and who knows how it will come out in any given circumstance. But I can guarantee you in each and every case, those individuals involved in this process will be convinced that they have let right prevail. Because they are in a position, and only they are in a position, to lay up all the particular facts involved. And I call that environmental tyranny. You can do so much better here and everywhere if we had an environmental law that was based upon abstract rules that committed governments in its three branches to an administration of justice that was in accordance with those rules. Because then people could plan. Then people would know what they were allowed to do and not allowed to do. And you'll note this. One of the responses to this is, well, this is not in an environmental sense in particular, the physical surroundings are so different that ecosystems require a particularized approach. You've got to be hands-on. You have to know what's there. Water, land, animals, you can't just have general rules. Note the effect of this qualification of this rule. And this is not always the case, but it is usually the case. You have a statement of what appears to be a general rule prohibiting environmental impact. And then the instrumentalist part of the rule flows in the other direction. It is the thing that says, yeah, environmental protection, but not quite so fast. It is the thing that prevents environmental rules from being environmental rules. It's the source of the leakage that starts as a leak and ends as a torrent. It's the thing that makes environmental regulation and environmental control to be more apparent than real. Imagine the results if you didn't have this bit. My god, you have a rule in this province that said nobody can cause an adverse effect. Now, that's an environmental rule. Tough one, to be sure. And maybe that's not the general rule that you want. But my god, what a great environmental rule. But that's not what you have. I'll stop there. Let's talk. Yes, sir? And secondary to all of the above is, is that if there's any, any chance of that holding any water, the system has now delegated the fact to the environment uh, despite the federal rule, which is under the John Christian liberal thing, saying that the uh, government was responsible for any environmental damage cleanup, and that they eliminated the funds and the resources for the enforcement of 401. So uh, there are not enough uh, environmental officers, there are not enough scientists, they're removing the, the um, information received from water testing, soil testing, uh, and the right to information agencies so that any possible discussion of 401 within the rules of 401 are no longer available to anyone. So they removed the financing that possibly could uphold 401. Uh, that's, that's true, that's true. Now, um, contained within that are, are questions about method, yes? So, for example, there is that fundamental question about whether uh, rules about environmental matters should fundamentally be public rules enforced by a bureaucracy or private rules enforced by private people or both. Um, but the more you get into the regulatory model, the more funds you need, the more people you need, and the more people of the control panel that you need. Right? So there is a danger that you go along with this kind of a provision and say, well, this, is, this will work as long as we have enough people and enough resources and enough investigations to make it work. Well, that means you get a whole bank of computers and people sitting at machines trying to figure out what to do. And you know, you could argue that that might, at the end of the day, improve the result that you might like, but still not really a rule of law approach. What they've done is given the 2A people, the ones who have decided that this is in our best interest do things, whether they are public or